Thank you, Linda. Good morning, everyone, and all that is listening online. When I learned the message for today was focusing on boats and lighthouses, I began to pray for guidance and what to say for the call to worship. A short time later, Aaron, Chris, and Chloe invited me on a trip to the Ark Encounter and Creation Museum. This experience helped me learn the magnitude of this special boat and how Noah followed God in unimaginable ways. With this fun experience, I believe my prayer was answered. Along with the ark, Jesus' time in a boat with his disciples was another remarkable time in God's plan. As we prepare for Valerie's message today, I am reminded of how truly awesome God's perfect timing is. Thank you, Linda. At this present time, we will please all stand if possible, and we'll be singing from a blue hymnal, 588, which is located in a pew in front of you.
do the responsive reading now. O come, let us sing to the Lord. For the Lord is a great God, a great King above all gods. The sea is his, who made it, and the dry land, because he formed it. Please remain seated, and we'll be singing a hymn 302 out of the Grace Book, which is at the bottom of a pew in front of you. For the scriptural reading this morning, I will be reading for the, from Mark 4, 35 through 41 in the NIV edition. That day when evening came, he said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There was also other boats with him. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat, so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said to him, Teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebunked the wind, said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. He said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Valerie.
Will you bow in prayer with me? Loving God, thank you for this morning, for this day, for the sunshine. Be with us um, during this time of study and would just ask that you would help me to be clear and um, deliver a message that was laid on my heart by you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 21 years ago, we flew to Washington and Oregon to check off two more states on Gary's bucket list of visiting 50 states. We flew into Washington, and in our wisdom, on our very first day in town, before we adjusted to the time change, we made the decision to take the Black Ball Car Ferry from Port Angeles, Washington, to Victoria, British Columbia. I had never been to British Columbia, and as a Canadian, I felt I should see all the provinces. And my dad's parents had always talked about their visit when they took a bus tour from Ontario to British Columbia to see Butchard Gardens. And they talked about the beauty of that. So we got up at O Dark Hundred and drove our rental car to the location to drive onto the ferry. As directed, Gary drove the car into the boat and parked. As it was cold, very early, and not quite light outside, we decided to find a seat indoors at the front of the boat where we could watch our 90-minute trip across the strait. It wasn't raining or particularly windy when we embarked, so we didn't anticipate that we would be riding through a storm, a vicious storm. The, the water seemed just a little bit choppy, and I found some comfort in the lighthouse that helped guide us through the waters, but soon the boat began to rock, side to side, front to back, waves were hitting the front of the car ferry. We were in a big car carrier, and so I thought we were going to be safe, but I'll tell you, I was scared and nauseous. When the winds hit the windows, I got very scared. But our God was with us in that storm and through the storm. Now I must pause for just a moment to apologize to Roy. Because Roy, as an experienced sailor, really knows more about boats than I do. And he knows about navigating the sea, and I don't. So Roy, bear with me. As I, if I say ship when it really was a boat, or I say boat when it was really a ship, um, I've had occasion over the years to be on both. But you should know <clears throat> I'm not a swimmer. As a matter of fact, when I get near a body of water, Gary calls me an anchor. <laughs> it's just, you know, floating has never been my forte. So I would like to feel safe on a boat, however... It should give us all pause that I'm even talking about boats this morning. Also, in your bulletin this morning, there's an insert. And these are scriptures that I found in preparing for today that speak to boats, light, God's providence. Don't worry, we're not going to read them all. We will touch on eight in the list, so I'll challenge you to figure out which eight I'm going to actually talk about. So the story of Jesus calming the storm appears in three of the four Gospels, and each telling has some different details. And so I'd like to start by giving a summary from each of the Gospels heading up to Jesus calming the storm. In the Gospel of Matthew, starting in chapter 4, Jesus was tempted by Satan. He began his ministry. He called Simon and Andrew, James and John. He went through Galilee and healed the sick. He delivered the Beatitudes, and he taught many, many lessons in chapters 5, 6, and 7. Then in chapter 8, he healed the man with leprosy and continued to heal people, including Peter's mother-in-law. People were taking notice, and crowds were following him. And then beginning in chapter 8, verse 23, it says, Then he got into the boat, and his disciples followed him. Without warning, a furious storm came up on the lake so that the waves swept over the boat, but Jesus was sleeping. 
The disciples went and, sp and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we're going to drown. He replied, You of little faith, why are you so afraid? Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves, and it was completely calm. The men were amazed and asked, What kind of man is this? Even the winds and waves obey him. And when they arrived to the other side, he healed two demon-possessed men. The Gospel of Luke, starting in chapter 4, begins with the temptation of Christ. Jesus is rejected at Nazareth. He drives out evil spirits. He heals many. He calls Simon and Andrew, James and John. He heals a man with leprosy, and he hears, heals the paralytic. He called Levi and taught, and then called the remaining seven disciples. Jesus teaches, heals, raises the widow's son, and is anointed by a sinful woman. A large crowd is there, including Jesus' mother and brothers. And then in chapter 8 of Luke, beginning in verse 2, we read, One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let's go to the other side of the lake. So they got into a boat and set out. As they sailed, he fell asleep. A squall came down on the lake so that the boat was being swamped, and they were in great danger. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we're going to drown. He got up and rebuked the wind and the raging waters. The storm subsided, and all was calm. Where is your faith, he asked his disciples. In fear and amazement, they asked one another, Who is this? He commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. When they arrived at the other side, he healed a demon-possessed man. And then if you have your Bibles open to the Gospel of Mark, it begins in chapter 1 with John the Baptist baptizing Jesus and Jesus' temptation. He calls Simon and Andrew, James and John. He dries out an evil spirit, heals many, including a man with leprosy. He heals the paralytic lowered through the roof. And Mark writes that Jesus recognized the faith of the friends. He calls Levi and he teaches. In chapter 3, he heals the man with the shriveled hand, and the crowds start to grow. Jesus appointed the remaining seven disciples and designated them as apostles. Jesus' mother and brothers were part of the crowd, and he teaches using parables. Then in chapter 4 of Mark, starting in verse 1, Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake while all the people were along the shore and at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables. I call this out to recognize that Mark's telling of the story, Jesus is already in the boat. And now we go forward to verse 35. That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, let's go over to the other side. And leaving the crowd behind, they took him along just as he was in the boat. There were also other boats with them. A furious squall came up and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Jesus was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke and he said to them, teacher, don't you care if we drown? He got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the waves, Quiet, be still. Then the wind died down, and it was completely calm. And he said to his disciples, Why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? They were terrified and asked each other, Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. And when they arrived to the other side, he healed a demon-possessed man. The Sea of Galilee in the time of Christ was surrounded by a dozen towns. The sea itself was 13 miles long and 6 miles wide and pear-shaped. The Sea of Galilee's surface is 700 feet below sea level, with steep mountains on both the western and eastern shores. It is fed by the Jordan River, which enters at the north and exits at the south, where it resumes its course to the Dead Sea. The water in the Sea of Galilee is fresh and sweet and abounds with fish. 
because it is just below sea level and with the bordering mountains, it's subject to severe and sudden storms. When we went to the Holy Land in 1999, we had the opportunity to take a boat ride on the Sea of Galilee. It was quite ideal, and we had a hard time fathoming the severity of the storm in this story. So when you all came in this morning, I heard a lot of chatter as you were wondering, what's all the tape all over the sanctuary? Some of you thought you'd move the tape. Thank you for not touching the tape. There is, for people on camera, I apologize to you right up front that you're not going to be able to see this, but the tape is the approximate size of the boat that Jesus and the disciples were in. So I need to do a little exercise here. I need the following people to please stand up and step into the center aisle inside the tape. John and Iris... Irma, come on, up we go, <laughs> Irv and Nancy, Terry and Lisa, Gary, Ken, John, fellas in the back, we've got to have Don, and we've got to have Bob and Jeff, come on, get in here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and yep, here we go, very good, there should be 13 of you in there. All right, inside the tape. You'll have to move forward, moving forward, moving forward, moving forward. This is not a big boat. 26 feet long from the front point to the back point. I know I'm not using boat language, Roy, I apologize. <laughs> Eight feet wide at the widest point. There are four big green X's on the floor, which actually represents where the oarsmen would have been. Because know, know this, there was no motor other than the muscles that were represented in the boat, right? And the boat was four feet deep. So the end of your pew is three feet tall, so figure another foot in there. So the 12 of 13 of you standing in the boat right now, and just imagine it starting to rock a little bit, forwards and backwards, side to side. You'd be scared too, right? All right, thank you. You can sit down. I wanted just to have that illustration, but please leave this, this tape where it is. Some of you are already sitting in the boat. Most of you are outside the boat in the water um, so far this morning. So. so thank you for that. The pillows represent where Jesus would have been. So my dad would croak if he heard me say this. I have nine points I'm going to make this morning. In these five verses, there are nine points. So we'll just go through this, and don't worry, we'll still be out in time for lunch. Point number one, the storm came without warning. How many times in our lives do we find ourselves in the midst of a storm that came without warning? Storms are something we all go through, both physically and spiritually. Some storms are just blips and come and go and are quickly forgotten but others forever change the landscapes of our lives. They uproot dreams and scatter our hopes far away. Their harshness leaves us gasping to catch our breath as our world crumbles around us. How do we keep trusting God in the storm when all seems lost and you don't know how to keep going? You trust God in the storm because even in the storm, he holds us in the palm of our hand. Second, Waves came over the boat, and the boat was being swamped. They were getting wet. The boat was collecting water. They were in real trouble. Imagine the disciples frantically bailing water. When our storm threatens to overtake us, it is natural, very human, that we try to manage it on our own when we should be going straight to God. Third, Jesus was sleeping. Jesus, fully God and fully human, was tired. He had been preaching and healing and teaching. He needed rest and time away from the crowds. He was comfortable leaving the boat tending to the professionals. The wind did not wake Jesus. 
The arguing of the disciples did not wake him, and water splashing over the sides of the boat did not wake him. But at the cry for help from his disciples, he instantly awoke. Jesus was resting in the boat while the disciples were trembling in fear. He awoke at their request and calmed the storm. When we let God arise in us and speak to our storm, things get calm. Four, the disciples were afraid they would drown and cried out for help. They were terrified. Remember, at least Simon, Andrew, James, and John knew their way around a boat and around this particular lake. The disciples had been in storms before, but this one was different. They were frightened. They had done everything they could before they awoke Jesus. Imagine the chaos of the scene, yelling at one another over the wind, trying their best um, to weather this adversity. The storm kept battering them to the point that they thought they would drown. They were used to the boat rocking. After all, they had just pulled in a monster haul of fish in Luke, 4, Luke 5 when Jesus told them to cast their nets again after a night without catching any fish. Simon and Andrew, James and John, had been with Jesus in a boat in a storm of fish once before. In their panic, they lost sight of what Jesus can do. I want to take a little detour for a moment to another story on the Sea of Galilee. This is the story of Jesus walking on the water. It's found in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and John. And in the essence of time, let me just hit the highlights. So Jesus has just calmed this particular storm that we're studying today. He continued to heal and to teach. John the Baptist had been beheaded. Each of the three Gospels tell the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And the disciples had been busy. They were physically and emotionally exhausted, having served bread and fish to more than 5,000 men, along with, I believe, thousands more of women and children. Jesus tells the disciples to get in the boat and go ahead of him as he needed time alone to pray. The boat, according to Matthew, is out a considerable distance, or, according to Mark, in the middle of the lake. So three miles, three and a half miles out. Remember, the lake is six miles wide. It was the fourth watch, so it was between 3 and 6 a.m. And Mark tells us that Jesus saw the disciples, and the, and the passage says, straining at the oars. The wind was against them, and there were waves. Sound familiar? Jesus walks to them across the water. The disciples <clears throat> are terrified, thinking that they're seeing a ghost. He assures them, saying, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Only in Matthew do we have the account of Peter climbing out of the boat and walking on the water. Jesus climbs into the boat, and at once the wind and waves subside, and they immediately reach the other shore. We are a lot like the disciples. We can easily focus on the wind and waves, and in our circumstances, we give up. We think we will drown in our adversity. We wonder if God is with us. Our faith is challenged, and God says to us today, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. And now back to our passage for today, my fifth point. Jesus rebuked the winds and the waves. The story is also an illustration of Jesus' deity because only God can make the waves and the winds obey. With a word, order was restored. One of the commentaries that I read about Jesus' rebuke is that it was the same terminology that he used when he rebuked and silenced the demons. He had driven out evil spirits before getting in the boat, and he was confronted with more evil spirits when he landed on the other shore. This indicates that Satan may have had a hand in this storm. Jesus knows, Jesus calming the storm is a show of his power. He sees what we are going through. He knows our fears, our anxiety, and our pain. 
and we are always in the palm of his hand. So not only is Jesus calming the storm a show of power, it is an incredible act of love. Six, the water was completely calm. All three Gospels state that the water was completely calm. And what strikes me about this is that it was instantaneous, completely calm. And have you ever been in a situation that was turbulent and scary, and it even felt deadly, and you cried out to God, and he brings immediate calm to the situation? When we drove our rental car back onto the Black Ball car ferry, after we had toured Butchert Gardens, I must admit that I was a little anxious, as our trip earlier in the day had been pretty unnerving. However, the water was calm, like glass, no anxiety, no fear, no worries. Confident in our carrier, we made it back to Washington without incident. Same water, completely different experience. Seven, Jesus asks, where is your faith? The apostles' lack of faith reminds us that even the ones who lived and walked with Jesus and saw his miracles firsthand and heard his teaching firsthand still found it difficult to be 100% faith-filled all the time. In that way, the disciples are a lot like us. Their lack of faith was rebuked, and so is ours. If Jesus was able to rescue the disciples from the storms both times, he can rescue us from the storms of everyday life. Eight, the disciples were amazed and asked, who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obey him. The disciples ask a good question, who can this be? So let's look at Psalm chapter 89, verses 8 and 9. O Lord, God Almighty, who is like you? You are mighty, O Lord, and your faithfulness surrounds you. You rule over the surging sea. When its waves mount up, you still them. And then my ninth point. Mark is the only gospel to state this. There were other boats. Until I was studying for today, I didn't even consider that there were other boats. And why wouldn't there be? There were crowds following Jesus, eager to learn and grow. They were hanging on every word. So it makes sense that some would have come by boat to hear him or would have rented a boat to follow him. And it makes sense that there would be, as Mark has said, other boats in the area. Those boats shared the same distress and danger of the sudden storm. So when Jesus calmed the Sea of Galilee, he not only rescued himself and his disciples, but all the others in the other boats. So fast forward to your own storms. You're in your own boat and crying out to God to calm your storm. Others see how you handle your storm and are impacted by your response, or they benefit from it. Who knows? But others in their boats are blessed because of how you handle your own boat, your own storm. There were others in the Bible who also had boat experiences. Noah, his ark was a vessel of salvation. Baby Moses in his basket, he was saved to lead the children of Israel. Jonah was overthrown and took, or, thrown overboard and took a ride in the great belly of a great fish. His was a storm of his own making, but when he hit the water, the Bible tells us, it immediately was calm. And Paul was shipwrecked. However, that did not stop his ministry as God saw him through his storm. Many have weathered storms. Many in this room have weathered storms. But know that God is with us and will see us through. Last June... Gary and I took some furniture to our nephew and his wife in Texas. We reserved a cargo van because that was an adequate size for the number of items we were transporting. When we made the reservation, the person on the phone said, and I quote, don't worry, 
if we don't have a cargo van for the same price, you, we will give you a nine-foot truck. Well, not excited at that prospect, we completed the reservation. On the appointed day, we arrived at the um, van rental facility and were told that our only option was a 16-foot truck. Much bigger and much boxier than we needed. We had to step up to step into the truck. We drove the truck home, packed it with the precious belongings we were going to take to Texas, and the items filled approximately one quarter of the truck, one layer. Needless to say, we were driving light. We set, all, set out and all went well on day one. Then came day number two of our trip. As we were passing through Arkansas and approaching Louisiana, we found ourselves in the middle of a storm without warning. While our truck was not a boat, we found ourselves in wind and rain that was scary. Thankfully, Gary was driving at that moment. However, he yelled across the wind and across the um, cab at me and said, I'm pulling over. That seemed to be a little scarier to me than just driving on. As you'll recall, I'm an anchor, not a swimmer. So we pulled over, and the wind was rocking our little truck boat. And like the Black Ball Car Ferry in 2001, I was peering out the window and watching the wind and the rain hit our windows and the water coming up in the ditch. And I was thinking, we're either going to get blown over or we're going to drown and get eaten by an alligator. I prayed like crazy, God, please see us through this storm. And he did. Before long, the storm indeed did pass, and we were able to continue our journey, a little shaken, but dry and on all wheels. One of the best images of standing strong in a storm is the lighthouse. I'm fascinated by lighthouses, and in our world today, you should know that there are 21,600 lighthouses. 18,600 of them are still operational. Lighthouses are not built on sand. They are built on a solid rock foundation near the water. A lighthouse way inland isn't so useful. It needs to be close to where the action is and where the danger is. It's a beacon that says, be careful, easy now, caution, caution. It is steadfast and steady and consistent in its work. It's always there. Gary will affirm for you my fascination with lighthouses. As I insist on learning the lighthouse keeper's story and climb up to where the light is and what it is that the light is cautioning boat captains about. And for me, there is great spiritual significance in the lighthouse. Never mentioned by name in the Bible, the verse most often associated with a lighthouse is Psalm 27, 1, which reads, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? In its time, lighthouses were vital to protect ships from crashing onto rocks or running aground. It's used to warn or guide ships in dangerous waters. A lighthouse itself does not move or change positions in storms, fog, waves, or darkness. It remains steadfast. And it, the light, um, the revolving light uh, blinks whether it's bright sunshine or the darkest of night, it continues to blink. While the Lord is our light and our salvation, we must be like a lighthouse. We must shine day and night for the goodness of every person. As symbols of Christianity, lighthouses have special meaning. They, rep they represent the guidance, refuge, and salvation that characterize the life of Christ and the meaning of the Easter season. Jesus used the imagery of a light to describe our role in the kingdom. We are the light of the world. He is the true light. Therefore, we are to function like a lighthouse both internally and externally. Internally, we project Christ's light in our lives. And externally, we reflect God's love and light into the darkness. 
Just as the moon reflects the light of the sun, we reflect the light of the sun, S-O-N, in a world of darkness. Lighthouses remind us of God's love. Dwight L. Moody wrote, We are told to let our light shine, and if it does, we don't need to tell anybody it does. A holy life will make the deepest impression. Lighthouses blow no horns, they just shine. In Matthew 5, verses 14 to 16, Jesus says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. John 8, 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. The story of Jesus calming the storm is a perfect example of our need to keep our focus on him, despite the storm that we are going through. Sometimes God lets us journey into a storm to teach us about himself. How does God calm our storms? Sometimes he steps into our boats with us, and sometimes he allows us to go through the storm, but never does he leave us in the storm. Even in the storm, we are held in the palm of his hand. We have to keep our eyes on Jesus, our lighthouse, so that we can withstand the storms. Trust God in the storm. He's got you even in the darkest moments of your heartache. You cannot be lost to him. He saw this storm before it ever reached you and has already worked out what you'll need to get you through. He will see you through. I believe that with all my heart. Through the storms of my life, God has seen me through. So whatever your storm, surrender it to God. The storms we face are far too heavy and large for us to deal with on our own, but we were never meant to. Take your burden and lay it at his feet. And like a lighthouse, be a light that points people to Jesus, and don't forget that you may be the lighthouse in someone else's storm. Let's pray. Loving God, you see us through our many storms, little ones, big ones, blips, catastrophes. We know that you are with us in everything that we face. Help us to have the faith of the disciples. Help us to cry out to you in any storm that we face and know that you are there with us. We pray these things in your name. Amen. If you're able to stand, we'll sing Love Incarnate from the Grace Hymnal, which is under the pew in front of you, uh, hymn number 257.
at present, we just want to remind you that the offering of box is on a back table. And now we will do the blessing of the offering. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, please accept this offering for all the blessings that you bestow on us, like sharing us with love, continuing to bless us with the message that we received this morning, our health, families, homes, and the food that nourishes our bodies. In Jesus' name, amen. The flowers this morning um, are in memory of Junior and in honor of Carol's birthday, my mother-in-law. It's a special time when you have both a mom and a mother-in-law who are as special as they are. So happy birthday, Carol. We have a busy week. Mennonite Women is on Thursday. Elders meeting is on Saturday. There is prayer meeting and Bible study on Wednesday. There's also a sign-up sheet on the back table for the April 15, Our Daily Bread. You'll notice in the um, bulletin that um, Nancy and Kathy are interested in hearing from you if you want to um, designate some flowers for Easter in memory or honor of a loved one. And um, the Bible challenge. I don't know how many of you are doing it, but I'm doing the Bible challenge. And we're past the midpoint of the Bible already. We just started that at the end of January, and we start Isaiah this week. So it's not too late to start, but you'll be reading about 30 chapters a day <laughs> instead of 10 to get caught up. But hopefully you are um, participating in the Bible challenge as well. Are there any other announcements? All right, let's look in our blue hymnal on the back pew. Back of the pew, 575, precious Lord, take my hand, and if you'll stand, please. know that this is typically a verse used as a benediction, but we're going to do it today. It's one of the verses, this is the eighth passage um, from your insert, and this is a message that Moses had delivered to Joshua, and he said, the Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never forsake you, nor for, leave you, nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Let us go in his name. 